Hi there. Um, thank you so much for joining me for this, uh, this session on the um, recommendations from the CDC and how you might uh, be managing your dog during COVID-19. Um, I got a lot of questions from people who um, interact with our videos on my Facebook page um, from previous clients, previous foster homes I've worked with, um, and I really just wanted to um, take a dedicated time to answer the questions that were coming up around um, pets in quarantine or if you're experiencing a level of isolation during COVID-19 uh, social distancing measures. Um, so that's what this um, session is dedicated for today. Um, I want to start for anybody who might be watching who who doesn't know me. Um, my name is Natasha Pupilin. I am a graduate of McMaster University's life science program. Um, I'm a certified professional dog trainer and I am a canine behavior consultant. So that's where I would like to speak from today is a place of experience as a trainer. It would go without saying, but I will mention I am, I am not a medical professional either in the human or the animal field. We just be, strictly be speaking about behavior and um, behavior impact um, if you were observing isolation for your dog. This talk was inspired by people's questions about the CDC recommendations, which came out in April, uh, at early May-ish, and those recommendations um, were posted to the website about um, isolating pets from people outside of the home and other things like that. Um, so let's just take a moment now, let's have a look at those recommendations and what they say. Um, the date today is May the 11th, 2020, um, so these will be accurate to what's posted today, um, but as always, those things could be updated or changed, so let's just um, point out that this is the way that it is as of today and we'll comment according to that. So if you are going to pop on to Google, let's as a starting point, let's come here to find that um, article. So I just looked for the CDC um, pets and COVID-19 uh, was how I searched for this and you would find it the same way. This article right here and so this article um, covers essentially what you would do during this time to be able to minimize risk of exposure to COVID-19 as it relates to the pets in your home. So let's just cover these key points so that we have um, sort of an information basis to start this conversation from. Um, it says that we do know, or we do not know the exact source of the current outbreak of coronavirus. Um, we do know it originally came from an animal source. At this time, there's no evidence that animals play a significant role in spreading the virus that causes COVID-19. Based on the limited information available to date, the risk of animals spreading COVID-19 to people is considered to be low. We are still learning about this virus, but it appears that it can be spread from people to animals in some situations. It goes on to speak about risk of animals spreading the virus that causes COVID-19 to people. Um, again, I'm just gonna highlight for you here, the, the, the risk of that is considered to be low. Um, and then we have some additional recommendations on the side that I want to bring your attention to. So if you have pets, Let's just click there. Uh, here are some of the highlights that we want to take about uh, or take from that as part of our discussion for today. Um, CDC is aware of a small number of pets worldwide, including cats and dogs, to be infected with a virus that causes COVID-19, mostly after close contact with people. Based on the limited information available to date, the risk of animal spreading COVID-19 to people is considered to be low. It appears that the virus that causes COVID-19 can spread from people to animals in some situations. Treat pets as you would other human family members. Do not let pets interact with people or animals outside of the house. If a person inside the house becomes sick, isolate that person from everyone else, including pets. This is a rapidly evolving situation and information will be updated as it becomes available. So what to do if you own pets? Um, do not let pets interact with people or other animals outside the household. Keep cats indoors when possible to prevent them from interacting with other animals or people. Walk dogs on a leash, maintaining at least six feet from other people and animals. Avoid dog parks or public places where a large number of people or dogs would gather. Um, this is really specific, right? And I think that so many of us um, have seen and read these, these recommendations or perhaps already have had implemented these recommendations before this being posted. Um, and I think this is where a lot of concern is coming in for some pet owners. Um, and I would love to be able to, again, just provide some additional discussion around this about um, what that would mean for the management of our animals or what this maybe has meant for you, um, whether or not there would be a positive or a negative impact on your pet's behavior as a result of observing these recommendations or following these recommendations. 
Um, and in addition, I'd like to talk about what we could do to mitigate or reintroduce our animals into sort of normal daily activity if you've been observing these recommendations in your home with your pets. Um, okay, so that's all I wanted to take you through for this site. Um, there's additional information here if you'd like to have a look, um, please feel free to do that. So again, not commenting from my perspective because I don't feel that I'm qualified to do that as to whether or not you should be following these recommendations. Um, I'm gonna leave all that to the healthcare professionals. Those will, will leave in their capable hands. Let's talk for a second about some of the ways that this might benefit you or your dog. If you are observing or if you are under the circumstances where you are forced to observe these social distancing recommendations, um, what are some of the benefits that might come from that? There are going to be benefits, although they'll be different for each family. Um, one of the benefits um, is that we certainly, if we're taking those CDC recommendations, um, is that there would be a limited or a lowered risk, right? So reduced risk of exposure to illness. Um, if your family goal is to prevent contraction of the COVID-19 virus until such time that, you know, the medical systems are better prepared to provide support if you need it, or until a vaccine is out, or whatever your family plan is, um, eliminating any additional exposures may be of value to you and your family. Um, so I would tend to think that that would be a benefit for people who are you know, choosing to do that. Um, there's also going to be the obvious and added benefit of lowering the risk for anyone who is immune compromised or perhaps significantly or considerably at risk for a greater um, expression of that virus should they get it. Um, we can think about people with heart conditions, people with medical complications, of course, you know, um, autoimmune diseases or disorders. Um, there are a variety of things within that that I feel like a lowered risk could be either important or essential for. So that's going to be an obvious benefit for you. The additional benefits that I can see for this um, may actually come from people who have existing behavior issues with pets. Um, I've heard a few comments now from, from friends and family saying that their reactive dog um, is actually benefiting from this time where when we're out on leash and we're out walking, um, people are taking that really intentional effort to walk out and around us and to give us six feet of distance. Um, that can be really nice if you're somebody who owns a dog who's in need of some space and you now, without having to ask, are having people provide that for your pet. So that could be potentially a benefit if you are needing a dog to have a little bit of space or perhaps wanting to implement some training to help support that. I think the other benefit um, that could really be helpful during this time is the opportunity to increase and to amplify that human dog connection. Perhaps the added time at home will give you the opportunity to refine the skills that you need to make it more manageable when you're out in the community with your pet. If you have been observing these recommendations for any period of time, um, there is at some point a risk that your animal, having not practiced warm, normal social behavior, perhaps if that's something they were capable of doing prior to COVID-19, um, that would impact their ability to maintain those skills. When I consider, you know, not going to the dog park, perhaps not going to daycare, perhaps um, restricting or not allowing your dog to greet and say hi to other dogs and people. Um, and I think about how long all of this stuff has been going on. Um, again, I live in Calgary, Alberta. So in my city, um, there's been a pretty significant outbreak. Um, and in addition, it's been for a duration of about six or eight weeks now where we've been restricted socially. So that's a very prolonged period of time for our dogs to be able to endure these sorts of um, restrictions. I think that if we discuss timeline in a little bit more detail, um, it might be helpful to recognize that each animal is an individual and I'm certain that you're going to find that there is a period of time at which you feel that this starts to be true for your animal where their behavior changes in terms of what they're able to maintain. That said, my experience, if you don't have a, a guideline or a baseline of your animal that you um, can reference in this case, my experience is that behavior that goes without practice for a period of four weeks or more is often behavior that begins to decline. And so you might be able to use that as a timeline for understanding whether or not you will need to implement various strategies to either preserve or re recover behaviors that may have been lost if your dog has been um, isolated for this period of time. So one example of this might be um, the confidence or the enjoyment of socializing, uh, whether that be with other dogs or other people. It may 
come as a decline um, behavior in terms of having lost skills that were previously being maintained. But it may also be the case that your animal has a behavior decline in the sense that the length of time where they haven't been engaging or interacting and then reintroduced to those situations can cause a rush of excitement and, and stimulation, which may be carried with them into that interaction and may cause impolite behaviors. Other um, behavior that you might notice as a consequence um, could be increased reactivity um, if an animal has had a prolonged, sustained um, isolation from other people or dogs. Um, you may notice um, a level of, of reactivity that arises when your animal is being reintroduced to those interactions. Um, I hesitate here to say that it would result in aggression and I want to maybe draw that line. I think that I am using the words reactivity to say um, behavior that may be barking or pulling or some sort of increased level of excitement. Um, I do not mean to say that there is a physical threat to that individual on the other side of the leash or the interaction. Um, I think it is possible in this situation that aggression may be an outcome of perhaps um, prolonged or sustained interactions in the home without sufficient breaks, um, but I don't feel that aggression is necessarily a direct result of or a direct um, outcome of um, prolonged isolation. Um, I think it is fair to cap that at reactivity, um, and if you're seeing an aggression issue with your pet, um, I would, under any circumstances, just recommend that you um, that you bring in the support of a professional to be able to assess and create a training plan for that particular behavior. Um, I don't think we ha can have a conversation about cons without acknowledging puppies may not be learning critical behaviors, um, and that is going to be a very big impact on uh, our dog's future and our dog's uh, ability to succeed in social interactions. Um, it is the case that you won't be able to provide it right now. And maybe you're already through this period and you haven't been able to provide it. By doing additional work with connection, commands, um, building rapport with that puppy, um, doing handling tolerance work, doing specific training around um, recall and agility and other things that we can do that provide a really strong human dog connection, um, which can help us ultimately navigate better, mitigate the impact of, and then work through any additional um, socialization challenges that we may have down the road. I think it's really important for us to be able to look at that uh, and recognize, although it isn't the way that it would have been done, um, we can do the best that we can for those puppies now. Um, we'll just be doing it differently. Um, let's move right along to what we can do uh, to make sure that you are putting all of the efforts in place today, tomorrow, and the next day to make the strongest um, recovery out of the situation that you possibly can. Uh, so whether you have a puppy or an adult dog, I want to encourage you to all uh, participate in some sort of daily enrichment. And that does not involve going out and buying anything that is expensive or time consuming. So it can be um, through taste, through smell, through sight, and through sound. Um, giving your dog some unique experiences or things to explore in their environment that will help them to um, use up a little bit of that energy that again they otherwise wouldn't. So some examples that you will be able to use for daily enrichment ideas, um, things like scent. Uh, scent can be introduced into the environment in the air or on an object that would be something the animal would not be able to ingest um, and that gives them the opportunity to smell that. Um, I'm sure if you do a little bit of searching, you'll find a list of dog friendly essential oils, which you may have at home, uh, which could work for this if diluted. Um, but also there is things like peeling an orange in the space. Scent enrichment can come strictly from you just providing some diversity in the environment that's immediately around the dogs. Uh, sound enrichment can be a wonderful way that you can provide a little bit of um, novelty as well and a little bit of variety for your dogs. Um, sound enrichment can be as simple as going on to Google and looking for sounds of the city or um, thunderstorms, which you can play the sounds of very quietly in the background. In recent years in the shelters that I've worked at, we have used things like the sounds of a restaurant um, and we've played that at low volume in the background for an hour or two in the afternoon just to give the dogs a sense of new sounds and new experiences that they can sort of take in. So um, with your own level of creativity uh, applied to this, um, again, thinking about whether that's an adult dog or a puppy, um, you might be able to supplement some of those auditory experiences that that puppy or dog is missing out on. Food enrichment is another wonderful way for you to be able to provide daily enrichment, which will not require for you to go out and buy special equipment. 
Um, if you are feeding your dog kibble each day, you don't need to do anything special. You don't need special treats. You don't need to go and buy special um, food additives. Um, all you need to do is use your kibble in a strategic or a creative way to be able to feed your dog um, in a way that's a little bit more engaging for them. So perhaps one of your two meals a day, instead of being fed from a bowl, can be fed from a snuffle mat if you already have one. Um, perhaps if you don't have a snuffle mat, you want to take that bowl of kibble and you want to sprinkle it around the carpet, um, making sure to get underneath the legs of chairs and around objects that may be in your home for your dog to reach around and to take. Um, additionally, you might just want to roll up things like a face cloth or a towel, sprinkling that kibble over the surface and then rolling that towel up for your dog to slowly unroll. Um, another really valuable way that you can both withstand or endure this time of social distancing but also come out stronger than you went in uh, is through those conventional training activities. So by training I mean teaching cues, teaching commands, and just practicing each day a little bit of time where you can work on a skill. Uh, and I think that each family will be different um, but I would encourage you to consider whether or not you will be doing training perhaps for the purpose of enrichment for stimulating your dog's brain and providing them with a unique activity to do or if this is something that you're doing to be able to reintroduce your dog into the outside world in a way that has a little bit more uh, ability to be managed and a little bit more structure that you can then uh, use to direct behavior. You can use this time to work on things like capturing eye contact or some sort of emergency recall cue, or even going so far as to build up the excitement of a positive interrupter um, so that you can interrupt unwanted behaviors if you are managing that. On the other side of things, you may want to just put in place cues or commands that your dog perhaps didn't have the reliability for before social distancing started. Um, I have spoken to a couple of families who are concerned about recall. You have the time now in your yard, in your home, perhaps in the park across from your house, you may be able to set your dog up for success by really spending dedicated time for even five minutes a day working on cues or commands that will strengthen your dog's behavior once your social distancing measures are up. Uh, your third option for navigating this situation as best you can and coming out the strongest that you can with your pet um, is behavior modification. Um, behavior modification work generally um, refers to changing an animal's emotional response as opposed to teaching a commander a cue. Um, and we are looking at something that is generally more severe. Um, the term that's used is maladaptive. So what that is, is that's to say that it doesn't make evolutionary sense. Um, you know, barking your head off at a lawn ornament down the street who's not a threat to your dog's safety um, is not an advantageous reaction. It is not serving a purpose, which is protecting the dog's safety. Um, it is an overinflated reaction to something that is otherwise unthreatening. So behavior modification is to say that we are going to take these unique or overzealous um, responses and we are going to reduce them to something that is much more appropriate to the trigger that the dog has identified. So changing your dog's emotional response to things like, you know, nail trims or um, perhaps standing on a scale if you have the opportunity to replicate that. Um, or perhaps just sitting on the front porch and watching people walk by um, and having your dog um, counter condition for um, seeing new people as they, they move through that space. And those are all excellent ideas and examples of behavior modification that you might have the opportunity and the time to do now that your schedule may not have afforded you the opportunity to do before. So as we move into the end of social distancing, and again, depending on where you live, this may be on the horizon for you. Um, as I said earlier, it's May 11th in Alberta, Canada, and Alberta is already talking about reducing social distancing um, requirements um, over the next week or two as starting in their phase one plan. As things change through each phase of, of reopening, I feel like it's going to be important for all of us to spend that extra time assessing our dog's response to these experiences that they're having. Your dog's next trip to the pet store to get that cookie or that bone from the staff member who works there may not come for some time. So if that's the example that we're going to use, um, I think assessing our pet's readiness to be able to resume these activities is really important. So um, I would encourage moving forward, asking your dog in your own mind, how are you doing right now? Um, how are you dealing with this? Um, how is your connection with me? 
How is your cued response to me? And asking if the dog is able to be successful. If you go back into your, let's say, daycare facility or your dog parks and your dog doesn't seem to be doing very well, try not to be frustrated with them. You know, try to understand and watch for signs that they may be having a hard time as opposed to signs that they may be giving you or other dogs a hard time. Um, and having some level of compassion for the fact that it's challenging for them and that they may need some support along the way, I think is gonna go a really long way for you and your pet um, to be able to find a new normal that's gonna work for you. Um, if you're finding yourself in a situation where you are reintroducing your dog to familiar activities and it is the case that that dog is not able to be successful there, um, I would encourage anyone who's feeling outside of their comfort zone or out of their depth to reach out to their local dog trainer, their favorite online resource, or whatever supports you feel that you have in place to be able to seek some advice for how you might be able to work through that. Um, my goal is to provide this information to you so that we don't wait until the point where you're reintroducing your dog to the environment and you're having challenges that are insurmountable for you. So that's my hope is that you're better prepared. My hope is that you um, can dig deep for the patience that you need because above all else, it's going to be um, something that we'll need to navigate um, and that that'll help you have hope and have some encouragement for getting through that. So that's my goal here. Um, if there is um, any questions that you might have as a result of this talk, um, again, you're welcome to reach out to your local dog trainers. I'm sure anyone in your community, we would be happy to talk to you about how they may be able to support. Um, additionally, I would be happy to field any questions in the comments below, um, and I will do my best to get back to you with whatever questions that you may have about your specific situation. Um, additionally, um, I've been providing resources and I will continue to provide resources on my Facebook page. Um, that's Fresh Perspective Dog Training and Behavior. And we are doing um, weekly, we're doing three times a week right now, um, weekly training videos that walk you through a progression um, each week of a behavior that people are requesting. So any requests that you have for topics that we could cover in those videos are most welcome. Um, again, this is, is aimed at being a resource that helps you come out the strongest that you possibly can through the social distancing um, and really set you and your dog up for success for their future. So thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate this. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I am happy to help.